Carols by candlelight service. If you're visiting with us, and I know a number of you are, you are welcome here this evening. I pray we'll all be blessed as we worship God and we'll be drawn closer to him as we listen to him speaking to us through his word, not just this evening, but right throughout this Christmas season. And God calls us to worship with these words, which are found in Galatians chapter 4. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Tonight we're going to look at Zechariah's song, and we'll see that he praised God for coming into this world to redeem his people. We're going to begin by praising God using once in Royal David City.
We're going to come to God in prayer now, and after this, the service will run unannounced. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to draw aside from all the preparations for Christmas, to focus on what your Word tells us about the meaning of Christmas, and to adore Christ the Lord. We bless you for granting us the freedom, the health, and the desire to do so. We praise you the good news of great joy which the angel brought to the shepherds that a Savior had been born in Bethlehem, fulfilled all the promises you made throughout the Old Testament about the one who would crush Satan's head. Perfectly holy God, thank you for your plan of redemption. We are so grateful that you did not just let mankind continue in our rebellion against you and then justly punish us for it. We bless you for coming into the world to provide the way for our sin to be forgiven, for us to be declared righteous in your sight, and for us to be adopted into your family. Sovereign Lord, help us to be excited about what you did at the first Christmas. Please do not let our familiarity with these events stop us from marveling at the miraculous conception of your Son in the virgin womb of Mary, so that he could become truly and fully human, while remaining truly and fully God. Help us to appreciate something of what it meant for Jesus to move into our neighborhood so that he could redeem us. We praise you that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. God of grace, we seek your forgiveness for the times we have continued to rebel against you by thinking that we know how to live our life better than you do. Forgive us for being impatient with your timing, resulting in us taking matters into our own hands rather than trusting you to work things out in your perfect time and way. Forgive us for all the ways we have broken your holy law and forgive us for not behaving as your dearly loved children. Thank you for assuring us that you so loved the world that you gave your only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Sovereign Lord, we bless you that Jesus is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. We praise you that there will be no end to the increase of Jesus' government and peace. Thank you that King Jesus reigns with justice and righteousness forever. So we long for the day when he will return to judge the peoples with equity and to establish his kingdom in the new heaven and earth which he will create. We bless you that then the wolf will live with the lamb, the cow will feed with the bear, the lion will eat straw like the ox, and the infant will play near the cobra's den, because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Almighty God, we pray that you will speak to us afresh during our Christmas services as we sing beloved carols, are ministered to by our praise group, and as we hear your word read and explained to us, may everything be done for your glory. Enable us to set aside the trappings of Christmas over this festive period, to spend time getting to know the Savior, Savior personally for the first time, or getting to know him more intimately. In his lovely name we pray. Amen.
The first reading is taken from Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 24. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all beasts of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between the seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, thou hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Curse it as the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. And the Lord God said, Behold the man become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now least he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden till till the ground from whence he was taken. So we drove out the man, and he... Um, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims, and a flaming sword was turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Here endeth the first reading.
There was a priest named Zachariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth, who was also descended of Aaron, both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations, blamelessly. But they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well on in years. Once when Zechariah, the division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before the God, who was chosen by God according to the custom of priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of the incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to return the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well on in years. The angel <laughs> answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among people.
Bob or Jones the Baptist. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord has shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, the Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, His name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened, and his tongue was loosed. And he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe. And throughout the his country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. and had prophesied, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up the honour of salvation for us and into the house of his servant David, as it was said through the holy prophets of long ago, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us, to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his body's holy covenant. The oath he swore to our father Abraham to rescue us from the land of our father's enemies, to enable us to serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. <coughs> and you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, by which to shine in those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit and lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel.
this evening for our Carls by Candlelight service. And I want to say a, a few words of thanks just to this stage. Thanks to everyone who has decorated our meeting house so beautifully for uh, our service this evening. Thanks to, to Bertie, to Robin, to Isaac, to Joanna, Menso and Tracy for reading God's word so clearly for us. Thanks to the praise group for their ministry and song and to Elizabeth for helping them to repair for this evening. Then there's a retiring offering this evening and it will go to Tear Fund. And after that, then there's a supper for everyone in the main hall. Uh, we hope you'll be able to stay and enjoy the good things that have been provided. And thank you in advance to everyone who's been involved in the preparations for this supper and who will serve it to us later. There will be a family carol service with the Salvation Army Band in Quilly Orange Hall tomorrow night at 8 p.m. And you'll be made very welcome at that service. Then Christmas in the Months is on Wednesday at 8 p.m. We'll study God's Word together, we'll sing together, and we'll enjoy some food together. And everyone is invited to come along, so please come on Wednesday evening. Our carol services next Sunday will be at 11 a.m. here in Macrally and 12.30 in Catesbridge. And then there's a carol service next Sunday evening in Macrally Parish Church at 6.30 p.m. And then on Christmas morning itself, our service here in Macrally will be at 10.15 a.m. and in Catesbridge at 11.15 a.m. We continue to praise God with the words of this lovely carol. Good Christians all rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Listen now to what we say. Jesus Christ is born today. I mentioned at our Carls by Candlelight service in Kate's Bridge that we were going to look at the songs associated with the first Christmas during our Christmas services this year. And in Kate's Bridge, we looked at Mary's song, which is recorded in verses 46 to 55 of Luke chapter 1. And when Gabriel announced to Mary that she had been chosen to give birth to God's Son, this gave her an insight into God's character. Mary came to understand that God is mindful of his people, which means that God knows all about our situation, he cares about us, and he promises to help us. Mary also came to understand that God is mighty, 
So God is always able to keep the promises He has made. This means God always fulfills His purposes, including His purposes in the salvation of His people. The lyrics of our favorite songs tend to become embedded in our memory, so that as soon as we hear someone singing the first line, we recognize the song and we're able to sing the rest of the words either in our head or out loud. This is true for both secular songs and Christian songs. It's hard to find a more memorable first line than the opening words of Zechariah's song, which we're studying tonight. Mary conceiving the Son of God by the power of the Most High overshadowing her is the only supernatural conception there has ever been in all of history. But there was another special conception that took place at the first Christmas. Before the angel Gabriel visited Mary, he had visited Zechariah to announce that his wife Elizabeth would become pregnant despite Elizabeth being barren up to this point and them both being well on in years. Robin, Isaac, and Joanna reminded us of this when they read from the start of Luke chapter 1 earlier. Gabriel instructed Zechariah to name their son John and went on to say that he would grow up to make a people prepared for the Lord. And this is what Zechariah sang about as baby John lay in his arms. The first line of Zechariah's song contains two words that are at the heart of the Christmas message. He said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. The two words are come and redeemed. God came to earth. God moved into our neighborhood to redeem his people. If we want to understand what the first Christmas was all about and therefore what we should be celebrating every Christmas, we need to grasp the purpose of God's visit. We need to understand the word redemption. Redemption is providing a payment to free someone. Zechariah explained God's work in his time by referring back to God's work at the time of the exodus from Egypt, which took place about 1,500 years before Zechariah's time. God's people Israel were enslaved by Pharaoh in Egypt. Despite Pharaoh's resistance, God freed them through a series of plagues which he sent against the inhabitants of Egypt. The last plague was the worst. God warned that the firstborn in each family would die unless the blood of a spotless one-year-old male lamb was applied to the sides and top of the doorframe of their house. God's people killed such a lamb, applied its blood, and were spared. But the Egyptians, including Pharaoh, suffered terrible loss. Devastated by what his decisions to resist God had done to his nation, Pharaoh let the Israelites leave Egypt. God had redeemed his people. Zechariah began his song by stating that God was redeeming his people again, not from enslavement to an Egyptian king, but from enslavement to our sin. Zechariah wasn't referring to being redeemed from a physical plight. He was referring to being redeemed from a spiritual plight. Later in his song, Zechariah said, And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Sin is an unpopular word in our society, which prepares to speak about people's lifestyle choices, flaws in people's characters, and the extenuating circumstances people find themselves in. 
But sin is a word the Bible unashamedly uses. And a word, it's a word which explains both what we see within us and what we see in the world around us. Sin is essentially us putting ourselves where God alone deserves to be, which is in the place of authority, so that we seek to run our own life and chart our own course. Sin is saying to God, either very politely or somewhat rudely, I don't want you, I will not listen to your word, and I won't obey your commands. Sin literally means to miss the mark. If you've ever played darts or tried archery, you'll know it's very difficult to hit the bullseye. The Apostle Paul wrote, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So everyone misses the bullseye when it comes to glorifying God. This means we fail to respect please love and follow the God who made us, who sustains us, and who gives us everything we have. And we need to be clear that we all miss the bullseye of God's glory by a mile, not by a millimeter, not by an inch, by a mile. Even those of us who have lived what we consider to be an upright life, often we don't care that we sin and fall short of the glory of God because we aren't even trying to live to please God. Instead, we're living to please ourselves. And even when we do care about God's glory, we often still fall short because we fail to rely on God's help to obey Him. Sin is something we choose And yet sin is also something that traps us. This means we can't stop sinning by ourselves, even if we want to, because we have become enslaved to what we've chosen. Sin isn't just a bad habit we have. It is our greatest problem. (coughs) Some people suggest that our greatest problem is a lack of education or a shortage of employment opportunities, or an inadequate welfare system, or a lack of self-esteem. However, even the Christmas family gatherings of the most academically gifted, well-off, personally confident people are often occasions of discord and conflict. This proves that it isn't a lack of education or opportunity or welfare or self-esteem that fundamentally spoils our lives and spoils this world. It's sin that fundamentally spoils our lives and spoils this world. Sin causes alienation from others. Sin causes brokenness at the hands of others. And perhaps you're a victim of something that has been done to you. Sin causes conflict with others, not just the wars throughout the world, but also conflict in our marriages, in our families, in our workplace, and so on. Every time we tell a lie, or we feel envious, or we demonstrate anger, and so on, we miss the mark of God's glory. We spoil our own lives, and we spoil the lives of those around us. But this isn't the most serious aspect of our sin. Our sin has separated us from God, and it has crippled our ability to know God. Bertie read from Genesis chapter 3 how Adam and Eve tried to hide from God when they had sinned against Him, and how God banished them from the Garden of Eden after they had rebelled against Him. We can't make our own way back to God because we're trapped in our sin. We're enslaved by our sin. This means we're hopelessly cut off from God, both in our present life and our eternal future. Paul reminds us that God has set a day when He will judge the world. God's judgment on that day will be absolutely fair, and it will be completely final. 
We have separated ourselves from God by choosing to sin against him and against other people. So in the afterlife, God will give us what we have chosen in this life. We'll be separated from God's grace and everything that's good for all eternity in the place that Jesus called hell to endure the just punishment for our sin. And God's judgment of evil resonates with our sense of justice because God created us in his image. Every time we hear in the news about some terrible human act and think, why doesn't God do something about that? We're actually asking God to judge the perpetrators of that act. The Bible assures us that God will judge and will punish all sin. And that is very good news when we suffer at the hands of sinful people. But it's also deeply troubling news because all of us are sinful people ourselves. Sin is our greatest problem because it separates us from the God who created us to live in a loving relationship with him and to glorify him. This truth about sin explains life as we experience it every day. An almighty, loving God made us, so we're capable of acts of greatness and kindness. But we have rejected God's authority, so we're capable of selfishness and evil. We were made to enjoy life with God eternally, but we have all lived in defiance of him. This explains the flatness we feel in January after the busyness and distraction of the Christmas season has ended. We soon realize that there isn't a gift we could buy or receive that completely satisfies us. There isn't a holiday we could go on or or a relationship we could have or a substance we could take that will actually fill the hole in our life. When we acknowledge this. We're really saying, God, please take this awful space between me and you and fill it up. We're asking God to redeem us from the slavery of our sin that we can't escape ourselves and from the debt that we can't repay ourselves. Many of us may have had an accident that was our fault, and the person whose car or property we damaged said something to the effect, somebody will have to pay for this. Of course, they're perfectly justified in saying this because a wrong has been done, damage and hurt has been caused. In a similar way, someone will have to pay for our sin. God doesn't ignore our sin, or say that our sin's no big deal, or tell us not to worry about it. God cares about how our sin spoils the world he made and spoils the lives of those he made. God cares about how we reject his authority and seek to take his place. Our sin makes God justly angry. God loves justice and brings justice. So he doesn't let people off with their sin. Instead, there's a price to be paid for our sin. Either we must pay the price or we trust someone who doesn't share our predicament and who's willing and able to pay the price to free us from the consequences of our sin. This would be like a friend arriving at the scene of our accident taking out their wallet and paying the person what they require to fix their car or property and satisfy their justified anger. When it comes to our sin, we need God to come and we need God to pay for us. And that brings us back to Zachariah because he sang about how God did just that. God came, and he came to redeem us. He came to pay the price to free us from our sin and to restore us so that we can know him and live with him forever.
to truly understand the first Christmas and why it is such good news, we need to truly understand our predicament. This involves accepting the nature of our sinfulness and the seriousness of our sinfulness. In other words, it involves letting God, rather than our society, define what sin is. Sadly, the majority of people in our society don't view sin as an offense against God first and foremost. Instead, they just view it as something that's had a negative impact on their life, which they need help to get cleaned up. So they'll never understand what God was doing at the first Christmas. God didn't come to merely help us put the bits and pieces of our life together in a way that brings us wholeness and stability so that we would be happy. God didn't come to provide us with a little religious energy that would make us nicer people. God came because we were drowning, being pulled down by the weight of our sin and miles from the shore. When we're drowning, it doesn't help for someone to come along and say to us, come on now, try a little harder, swim a bit better, then you'll be able to get yourself out of the trouble you're in. No, we need them to reach down their hand and grasp ours and pull us into the safety of their boat and take us back to the shore. When we accept that we're drowning, we don't refuse the person who offers their hand to us. We grab it and we splutter our gratitude to them. And that's what Zechariah did. He knew that his son John would go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation, of, to give his people the, the knowledge of rescue and redemption through the forgiveness of their sins. Zechariah knew that his son John would spend his life saying to people, God is coming. God will redeem you. God will rescue you. Trust in him. So everyone who truly understands what God was doing at the first Christmas can join with Zechariah to sing, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. God came to earth. God moved into our neighborhood to redeem his people, to free them from their sins, and to fill up the space between himself and us. The only question remains is, are we trusting him to be our savior so that we experience this redemption he came to provide? If you're not, I would plead with you to turn to God tonight. Don't wait, turn to him tonight. If you are trusting in him, then go out from here tonight and tell people the very simple message which explains Christmas fully. God came to earth to redeem his people. Let's come to God in prayer now and let's ask him to apply these lessons we have learned from his word to our heart <laughs> as he sees our need. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for that first Christmas. We thank you for what you've recorded about it in your word. Father, it was a, a truly wonderful time, and there's many things about it we would love to know more about, but Father, you've told us everything we need to know. And Lord, the, the central truth of that first Christmas is so simple, even a child can understand it. God came to earth to redeem, to save his people. It is as simple as that, and yet it is as profound as that. Because, Father, if we miss this, we don't just miss what Christmas is about. We miss eternity. We miss the opportunity to live with you forever in that perfect place you're preparing for your people. So we pray that you will impress this truth upon all our hearts tonight and help us to believe it so that we're redeemed, 
so that our sin is forgiven, so that we're adopted into your family, so that we have the gift of eternal life, so that we can have the sure and certain hope of living with you forever. Lord, help us to grasp this and then help us to go and gossip it to everyone we have contact with. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing carol is Hail to the Lord's anointed, great David's greater son. Hail in the time appointed, his reign on earth begun. Father, thank you for the food which you have provided for us and for those who have taken the time to repair it and will serve it to us. Bless it to our bodies and bless our time of fellowship together. 
Then send us out of here with your grace, mercy, and peace, resting on us and empowering us to live for you and to tell others about how you came to redeem us from our sins. In Jesus' glorious name we pray. Amen.